So to start, we would like to give the floor to Marcela Ojeda. She is the Director of Capacity Building and Vice Director of the IAI. Welcome, Marcela. She will be talking to us from the Center of Science Diplomacy in this specific pillar, which is emerging issues. So, Marcela, please go ahead. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Ines, for the warm uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure for me to be able to be with all of you today in the first series of webinars of the Center of Science Diplomacy to discuss about emerging issue issues and innovation. This topic is a hot topic, not just for organizations such as the IAI, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, but also for our Science uh, Diplomacy Center. So I would like to harness this opportunity of this webinar to then present a bit to you about what the Science Diplomacy Center is, why we've launched this center in 2023, what the, diff the main activities are that are ongoing and our priorities for the work uh, of the center in the upcoming years and to invite all of you to uh, uh, social actors, uh, researchers and scientists working in the interface between science, politics, diplomacy, and to collaborate with our center and to participate by bringing your expertise, interest and experience in order to consolidate the center as a regional reference for the countries in the Americas regarding training, regarding international cooperation and the interface between science policy to address the great uh, challenges and environmental change. The Center for Science Diplomacy, therefore, as I've mentioned, has been approved by the Conference of the Parties, 19 governments, that are part of the IAI last year. And it was a year, a very special year from the past couple of years. And we've observed the increasing importance of science diplomacy, not just in the Americas, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, but at global level, there is much interest. There's an increasing interest from governments of countries regarding science diplomacy and how science diplomacy can support addressing the main issues we are facing today, challenges such as climate change, such as loss of biodiversity, also best uh, ocean management and other global, regional and transborder issues. Therefore, the IAI, um, established, set up in 1992 in the first couple of years and decades of his work has invested greatly in supporting the development of science and to create connections between uh, scientists from different countries and to create cooperation networks in the um, area of science. And we've had a great impact in generating knowledge, processes and global environmental change based on science, new generations of scientists and decision makers working on uh, global change. However, we saw that there is still a great challenge ahead, not just for the IAI, but for several institutions as well, which is interaction between science and decision-making processes, both public and private and the different sectors. In this regard, we believe that the center therefore could become an excellent mechanism in order to develop programs, activities, which are innovative and that can actually set this better communication uh, and collaboration between countries across multinational cooperation, multilateralism between the different governments and academia. Next slide, please. The mission is basically to train decision makers from different sectors 
from different government levels, general, regional, local, uh, together with scientists and other representatives of, uh, of civil society to support governance and the cap capacities of collaboration at international level, linking professionals, countries and organizations, and connect agents regarding priority topics of the agendas of countries based on uh, science programs and resources that could be provided through the IAI. We have identified three initial pillars. The main is capacity building, the first one. This is for decision makers and to develop a knowledge hub platform on science diplomacy so that different individuals and institutions can have a common resource to find information, materials, and science diplomacy strategies that can guide and steer the work of the region. And the third pillar, which is what we're here together for, is emerging issues, topics where we see that science is advancing, such as AI, technology, uh, quantum blockchain technologies, among others, and where the IAI can be a broker, a facilitator, a neutral party in the region, also bringing rep government representatives and other stakeholders to the table so that we can move forward in these topics for the benefit of society overall and harness technologies to support decision making and to prevent conflict between science and uh, and politics at global and regional level. Next slide, please. So to conclude with this introduction and with the opening remarks, we hope that everyone here is able to participate, not just in the framework of this webinar, but also to get to know the work that we are undertaking currently regarding capacity building, a series of workshops on training that have started since last year that were held in Panama, also in Brazil, in uh, the upcoming year in Paraguay. And the idea of these workshops is to have regular events where we can train more countries, more institutions by having the contribution of different areas of expertise on, on science as well as emerging issues that will also change significantly the way in which science is being done the decision making in both public and private sectors. So I conclude with this. I am honestly very glad to be with everyone here and also to thank all the panelists who will be presenting their topics today. Some of them are great friends and collaborators that have worked together have supported significantly the work of the IAI to date and hopefully in the future as well. Thank you, Inez. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marcela, for the introduction of the Center for Science Diplomacy, for the pillars on emerging issues. And now we're going to move on to introducing the panelists that are with us today. As Marcela was saying, many are collaborators. They are partners of the IAI and also step fellows. So it's a great family here at the IAI working jointly to think and address emerging and uh, current issues. The webinar has three main axes. The first one is participatory uh, diplomacy, how science diplomacy can anticipate to certain issues that are of a global nature and that require the collaboration of several institutional and social stakeholders, specifically the relationship with technology, how that technology can be harnessed and to make it inclusive for there to be more participation from different social actors, especially local communities, indigenous communities, how we can set dialogues between all of them and share experiences to expand decision making for it to be more legitimate, more inclusive and more relevant with a greater impact on what concerns us, such as the Anthropocene and the perspective that human beings have become a transformational force 
that not only includes climate change, but also the loss of biodiversity and the massive extinction of different species. So all of these problems with the label of Anthropocene require solutions that imply collaboration between countries since climate change, the loss of biodiversity and the change in soil quality uh, does not know of borders. And therefore we need more training, we need more collaboration and also partnerships between countries so that we can address all these global issues. So I'm now going to introduce our panelists. Today we have five experts on their topics. Some are more linked to, uh, with uh, science diplomacy, the topic of this webinar. Others are more geared towards technology and platforms that use technology, different approaches to uh, nature-based solutions. So I'm going to introduce each one of the speakers, our panelists. The first one Anna Watson. She is a fellow of science diplomacy in the postdoctorate University of Calgary and uh, extraction of CO2. She was a fellow of this STEP program and she had her po um, PhD in the University of Calgary based on political transformation uh, and uh, rights of the Amazon region. She has a master's degree in the environment by the um, Pontifical um, University in Peru and also from La Morina. She has more than 15 years of experience in international development and integration of biodiversity. The second panelist is Susan Benavides. She is vice uh, director of the University of the Americas and coordinator of the intersectional table of science diplomacy in Colombia and a member of the Latin American Network of Science. She, we would like to highlight that they have signed a cooperation agreement with the IAI, and this allows us to uh, strengthen our bonds with such a prestigious uh, institution that develops science diplomacy in the region of the Americas. She's a lawyer specialized in international cooperation and project management for development with a master's degree in science, technology, innovation and um, policies and interdisciplinary support for development. Then we have the third panelist, Ulcia Urrea Mariño. She is from Mexico and uh, has a PhD in marine and coastal uh, environments and the Gulf of Mexico studies from Texas University in the United States. She's also a member of Science Diplomacy Network, and she has studied integrated areas and coast areas in, La in Latin America and the US, uh, in seas and coastlines and the interaction with climate and science diplomacy in the Gulf of Mexico. Then we also have Julius Bright, uh, who's a step fellow and consultant of uh, humanitarian office uh, in the US. He is an ecologist and conservationist of wildlife uh, by Harvard College and a PhD from Oxford University. Julius has worked on, um, on addressing idiosyncrasy of uh, current challenges. He's currently a consultant of uh, science platform in the United States. He works in water management and natural resources in Latin America, the Caribbean, uh, the North of Africa and Central Africa. He's passionate about nature-based solutions to address long-term effects such as uh, food security, uh, water resources, and to face these challenges brought up by climate change. The fifth panelist is Karina Combo. She's from Argentina. She works at the uh, um, Organization of American States from Belgrano University. She's a specialist from FLAC. So, uh, Department and she works with communication and uh, with Austral University. She has more than eight years of experience in international relations in uh, 
international program management. She has been an advisor for strategies and uh, international cooperation uh, policies on it, technology and innovation, science diplomacy, and articulating with the uh, Argentinian Foreign Affairs Department. She's currently working in internationalizing uh, tech companies and is consulted on science diplomacy on the Ibero-American organization. She works in the academia, technological environment and science diplomacy. So having said all of this, I now give the floor to Anna Watson. Thank you, Maria Inés. Uh, and Marcela for this invitation and for everyone who is present today to discuss such an interesting topic, which is how we can link together human activities and the challenges that we are facing as a global community, as well as climate change. So I'm going to share my screen with all of you because the first question that we were asked was how can you, you provide nature-based solutions to uh, emerging issues. One of the global emerging issues that was much discussed in the last COP on climate change, and that is also addressed in other international instruments such as the uh, Biodiversity Conference, is this urgency to find alternative solutions to CO2 emissions. And the different models on climate are pointing to the fact that we're already late to providing these solutions. Although the first measure is to cut on uh, greenhouse gas emissions in order to avoid the increase in global temperature. But because we're already uh, lagged behind, scientists point out to the fact that this will no longer be the only solution that is required apart from this. Uh, there are also other alternatives that are needed to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that has been emitted in the past few years. Uh, the inheritance CO2, as they call it, how can we clean this up? So, in the IPCC, there is a working group that discusses different methods to extract CO2 from the atmosphere. This uh, methodology is complementary to reducing emissions, and the aim is to carry out activities which are uh, human-driven to remove and store CO2 in a... Um, alternatively from the atmosphere. The methodologies are quite varied from the most conventional that offer nature-based solutions such as reforestation, biochar, soil carbon sequestration, and uh, the use of wetlands and land use. And some innovative solutions include pilot studies, and moving on to more industrial solutions, which are technological, they're still in the stage of being experimented and trying to find a viable alternative for them to uh, be carried out in terms of extracting and removing CO2 at a large scale. In this webinar, we've been asked to focus on nature-based solutions. And in part, it's because the surveys that have been carried out regarding uh, the opinion of the population at large and the opinion of decision makers on the different methodologies that are in place point to the fact that in Latin America, the main trend is towards a positive uh, perception of nature-based solutions. And why? Because nature-based solutions from their theoretical point of view are steered towards preserving and conserving natural ecosystems that have great potential to capture CO2. And also because they should be guided to providing uh, comforting solutions to local communities, as well as providing adaptation strategies to these communities to face climate change impacts. In other words, it is presented as a solution framework, which is a win-win situation. And these solutions are still quite theoretical still. Currently, the governance of these new issues require, first of all, international cooperation, 
and adapting the different mechanisms of capturing CO2, and that also includes binding agreements. But most importantly, how can we gather lessons learned from the different methodologies, which, as I've said in previously, are more conventional, and that in the past have left us with a feeling of inequality and exclusion from um, different sectors where these activities are undertaken, where science diplomacy can also be uh, applied to more domestic issues, such as multicultural approaches to the First Nations or originary nations, which are sometimes the ones who have the rights on territories to provide these uh, nature-based solutions, or local communities which are quite rooted to the uh, ecosystem services and the services provided by nature in those regions. So there are alternatives, but there is still much uh, to be done to arrive to a democratic solution. As governments, as citizens, we need to decide how we're going to set these complementary tools to reduce CO2 emissions, but also at an international scale, how can we propose mechanisms and a framework that will favor this climate justice and access to benefits on uh, nature-based solutions in the different territories? And so Maria Inez, uh, I think uh, I only had five minutes. No, you were right on time. So now we will give the floor to Susan Benavides. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Maria Inés. Thank you, Marcela, and thank, and thank you, IAI. I would like to congratulate you uh, for uh, setting up this uh, Scientific Diplomacy Center. That is a reference for the region. And I think that it's very disruptive to have this approach on the emer emerging issues of anticipatory diplomacy. And that it, I think is an issue that we still have to go deeper into. I would like to share my screen now. And I would I will start with my contributions to today's webinar. Uh, this webinar um, is going to share information about Colombia. I would like to share how we have been working with this scientific diplomacy and uh, how this links to what we know as anticipatory diplomacy. I would like to tell you that as of 2019 in Colombia, um, we have developed an international uh, mission of uh, wisdom into 2019, we started to analyze the needs and the capacities that Colombia had and how Colombia needed to start developing these capacities and skills and um, options in order to be able to reach a, this long-term objective of the international mission and to be able to create a sustainable, Colombia, where knowledge supports all the decisions made in terms of public policies, in terms of development. Um, this is a great challenge for Colombia. We are uh, one of the most uh, um, unequal countries, and we would like to include more social mobility and social inclusion. And we are uh, the most uh, biodiverse country in Latin America. And we would like to see how we can add more biodiversity development in all the fronts, uh, especially in those that have to do with biodiversity. Within that perspective, we uh, have focused on the uh, biodiversity policies. And why am I telling you about this? Because we would like to have a scientific perspective so that we can anticipate the needs 
um, for science and research that countries have to start working on in order to be able to face the challenges that we have along the way. This innovation and research policy uh, has focused in five different missions. We have five missions for the next 10 years. Uh, this it comes from the uh, international mission of uh, wisdom uh, created in 2019. So we have different missions that have to do with sovereignty, with biodiversity, with science for peace. And we have missions that um, also include uh, hunger zero and transi energy, energy transition. The projection of, of all of these uh, missions have created a cross-cutting approach so that we can reach uh, or make nature-based decisions and uh, based on sustainability so that Colombia can, from biodiversity, become also a, a reference in terms of knowledge and innovation. This long-term uh, view that we have developed has enabled us to develop a very special approach in diplomacy in terms. As you can see, this is the summary of the different landmarks that we have had. And as you can see, the different milestones we had have enabled us to strengthen an agenda so as to fo focus our efforts in scientific diplomacy we have been able to reach to uh, the uh, foreign affairs department so as to make progress in this agenda and to be able to achieve uh, some progress in most of the areas that you have seen here. As you can see, this scientific diplomacy has enabled us to make a, a collective effort and uh, that has led to the development of the scientific diplomacy agenda. So along these lines, even though this is not so much projected as a specific uh, bet for the next five years, uh, it was achieved partly from the 2019 um, scientific diplomacy landmark that we have created in terms of science and technology uh, with the necessary diplomatic strength that it needs to have if we are to develop international policies so that scientific evidence could be considered when making decisions and make progress in the agreements. I'm telling you this because I would like to say and share with you uh, what I think are the challenges of anticipatory diplomacy. We are a country that has a long-term projection in science and technology. We know what needs to be done. We need where we need to focus our efforts. We have had a greater appropriation of scientific diplomacy in building the agenda. And, but these efforts we've made are not enough if we don't tackle the challenges that we face at the moment. And I would like to introduce three of these challenges to you. One of them has to do with the integration of science and policies. And even though we have a long-term view of long-term science, sometimes this is not accompanied by political coherence in our country. So we have seen different governments that have not prioritized the funding for these policies, uh, especially in terms of public policies or long-term science development. So we need to have uh, integration or alignment between political coherence and long-term science. Another one of the challenges has to do with the capacity building. This requires that institutions in creating science can develop the methodologies with prospective surveillance and technological surveillance so that we can 
take care of a long-term view uh, and to have a greater capacity to develop uh, fast diplomatic responses and that could be brought to the international arena so that for anticipatory diploma diplomacy, we can adapt to constant changes. Uh, we need that this can help mitigate the future risks and can help us uh, solve future problems that we are facing constant changes uh, to which we need to adapt quickly and we need more funding in order to be able to contribute to uh, the uh, constant change demands uh, from science. And a third challenge uh, that is not independent from the other uh, is one that shows that multidisciplinary and collaborative approaches are needed for us to anticipate to the problems uh, so that we can require multiple uh, approaches, uh, diverse multidisciplinary, so we can create the necessary dialogue so as to be able to anticipate to the problems, to be able to tackle these complex uh, collaborative problems and to be flexible in what we think uh, are the uh, experiences of some cultures or the diversity of some of the cultures because we believe that diversity is very rich and we should use this wealth to tackle these global uh, challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Susan, for your participation. The next one is, uh, the next speaker is Lucia Urrea Mariño. Thank you, Maria Inés. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, I will, I don't have a presentation. So I will mainly uh, speak about some of the things that Anna mentioned especially what has to do with the diversity in nature-based solutions uh, from a conservational perspective, ecosystem conservation perspective, uh, so that they can recover the ecosystems uh, and they can also include the technological or geoengineering issues that have led to technological interventions in nature so as to increase the efficiency of some uh, systemic uh, approaches. And within this framework that includes different typologies and actions, uh, we have seen, um, we have to include these nature-based solutions and other categories that are supplementary to these nature-based solutions that are called um, community-based solutions or infrastructure-based solutions or technologically-based solutions. And each one of them are based on the understanding that people relate in different ways towards their environments and that different social organizations can tackle these challenges differently. These challenges that include climate change, the loss of biodiversity and pollution. So when about these typologies, we have different institutions that um, have dealt with them, such as the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Uh, also, there has been efforts made by the Army Corps of Engineering Service. They tried in the United States to describe these situations and most importantly, uh, through this nature-based solution is that we don't have a universal solution to be able to respond to all the problems we have. And that we need to include uh, in the processes, in their design and implementation, the uh, highest number of players possible. Um, and to try to include local 
players, and I mean all of them. I mean original indigenous communities, but also in urban environments, we need to include the populations that are living in unregulated settlements, uh, urban and rural populations. So it's not just the territory, it's the demography of the territories, the people that have lived there, and also the projection of how environments are going to change. So this uh, involves and includes a significant challenge because we need to take into account the physical conditions of the environments. And this is where we need to include uh, international law, uh, such as uh, the precautionary principle and prevention principle that the prevention principle would include the statistics that we've had so far about sea climate change uh, and that would be the reference international source that has made the efforts that we know uh, through NOAA in the United States or um, if we uh, go back to IPCC, we can see these trends that we need to consider, the present territory, the future territory, how the territory will change, and how these solutions will be perceived and how they are designed and implemented. So through science, and this is an international and interesting challenge, how science is communicated to the populations, who communicates to the populations what science is, what are the institutions that are carrying out these projects. It's important to mention here as well, uh, the local governments, uh, uh, how the local governments and how the impact of climate change are implemented, are first suffered by the people in their territories. And usually they're the first ones to take action, even if there is no legislation available. So the local governments um, are the ones that firstly create uh, collaboration networks supported by development agencies, by uh, civil society organizations, so that they can share experiences about what worked or what didn't work and what could work. And these learning communities officially don't have the title of scientific diplomacy, but but they play a significant role because they share knowledge. Uh, they share the knowledge within a multilateral framework, even though they are not a climate change uh, or diversity COP, uh, but they have, uh, of course, um, experiences that have been carried out and shared. In, in terms of the coastal and maritime ecosystems, also we need to mention the issue of sovereignty because we have shared resources, but also on the borders of the different countries, uh, the uh, territories are dealt with differently. For example, uh, sh a shared ecosystem could be differently considered or differently managed uh, among the different countries, depending on the place where they are located. Uh, and that is also important to have this, uh, to be aware of the national constraints of the legislation and how they are applied locally. For example, man manglers in Mexico, they are handled locally and, um, and um, the municipalities don't have uh, much power on the strengthening of the mangler, manglers without considering federal regulations. And yet uh, they are, uh, these manglers are the ones that capture or um, CO2 the most. So it is important to analyze how the different social players uh, pay attention to the design and implementation of the, of the local 
players and how the actions of those who take action first are not necessarily those who bring the big projects. So um, all of these issues could be complicated to handle and to coordinate. And something that I would like to mention as well is that in a recent report that was published last month, we mentioned that uh, among the different economic and ecosystem activities carried out by the ocean, by the maritime and coastal systems, um, said that the uh, greenhouse uh, uh, gases uh, could uh, 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 capture about 13,000 tons of uh, CO2. This would be for 2050, and that would be about 35% of all emissions uh, for 2050, according to IPCC. And of the actions that we can mention, of course, it would be to stop extracting gas and uh, oil, from the different coastal areas, especially uh, by the US, but also to decrease emissions and to stop extracting uh, oil. The other one, uh, the other measure could be the substitution of the energy sources by tidal energy or wind energy. So many of these activities that involve rest carbon restoration. So blue carbon is this carbon that is in all the coastal and maritime systems such as uh, manglers, um, uh, kelp forests, uh, and coral reefs. And ironically, they are very important and they have uh, created a carbon market for the um, land forest, but the progress has been slow and the, it has been difficult to measure the amount of carbon or CO2 and um, it represents only about 0.2% of the accumulation that we've had so far. You have a minute. I would like to finish with that and to say that these international law principles that are important, especially in nature-based solutions, are just precautionary because we don't know how they will impact or how they will be developed in the future for the prevention. So we already have the science uh, to be able to see what sovereign measures and resources we have in order to reach international cooperation in this matter. Thank you. Now we will give the floor to Julius Bright Ross. Hi everyone, um, let me just share my screen really quickly. Um, here we go. All right, so um, my name is Julius Bright Ross. I'm a contractor with uh, the US Agency for International Development's Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. Thanks so much to uh, the other panelists for uh, their really excellent remarks. So I'm just gonna take you through a bit of the actual implementation of nature-based solutions for solving some of these global problems today. Um, so just a quick background about who we are. Uh, the Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance is the lead federal coordinator for the U.S. government's response to humanitarian crises overseas. We have a triple mandate to save lives, alleviate human, human suffering, and reduce the impact of humanitarian crises. Um, and one of the biggest global challenges we're struggling with in the realm of humanitarian assistance and needs is uh, droughts. Droughts are becoming more frequent and more severe in many of the places where we program funds. Um, and we're really struggling with the fact that there is not uh, really such a thing as recovery anymore from drought because droughts are becoming frequent enough um, that what used to be a 10-year drought now happens one and a half times per 10-year period. And that's likely only to go up. So. Um, 
under a two degree warning, warming scenario, which seems increasingly likely every day, uh, we are likely to see in drylands what used to be 10 year return droughts happening every four years. And that could even go up to every two and a half years if we let things get particularly bad under a four degree warming scenario. Um, so for example, in a place where we have programmed a lot over the past 20 years um, in Somalia, the years between droughts have been reduced from six to nine years, uh, all the way down to three to four years, which is no longer long enough for traditional pastoralists to recover their herds, um, thus making humanitarian needs much worse every time we have to respond there. Um, so part of the toolkit that we're using to deal with this new normal um, is water resource management and particularly nature-based solutions. So when we say water resources management at our bureau, we mean a wide range of activities that restore, improve, mitigate, and protect um, water resources for the purposes of meeting populations integrated multiple needs for water. So not just drinking, not just cooking, but also for the productive use of water, whether that be uh, grazing animals or small scale irrigation, or even the needs of water for many other businesses like textiles, et cetera. Uh, and this includes nature-based solutions uh, in the form of soil and water conservation, landscape restoration, but also the complementary social investments needed to make those and those uh, solutions investable, sustainable, and work for people. Um, so we have a lot of different examples, um, but I will talk to you today about one in Niger um, because it brings out a lot of the the very excellent points that the previous panelists have talked about. So. This is a program that we've been funding since 2014 um, through the World Food Program of the United Nations. Uh, it primarily takes the, 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 sh the shape of uh, food assistance for assets funding, which uh, essentially gives people food assistance in exchange for labor in the direction of creating assets for their communities. Um, the assets in question are half moon buns, sometimes called demi loons, um, zy pits, and farmer managed natural regeneration in agricultural fields and in pastoral communal land. Um, just over the period of 2020 to 2023, this was carried out over uh, over 150,000 hectares using our funding. Um, and that's not even talking about the six years before then, which were a slightly smaller scale, but still uh, working on the, the foundations of this. Um, so just a sort of visual representation, these are not a before and after, but this is comparing land in the same geography that doesn't have these soil water conservation structures to land that has actually been improved through this food for assets programming. Um, and I mean, you know, we're not making jungle here, but this is a substantial increase in the amount of vegetation and natural resources that actually are present on the land. So we carried out an evaluation of this program with uh, NASA and what we found, I mean, you can see it in these images, it's really tangible. Um, the natural, the naturalized differential vegetation index, so NDVI, increased by nearly 50% from 2014 to 2020, um, even after controlling for changes in rainfall. Uh, so this is, I mean, you know, that's a number, but even outside of numbers, you can see how much more vegetation there is that's accessible for the use of pastoralists, for the use of agricultural uh, communities. And this has meant a lot for people. So let's go a bit more into the results. This is based on a field evaluation carried out by our team and a couple of other multi-sectoral colleagues. Um, two years ago. So over 400,000 participants were supported through this funding. Um, someone seems to be drawing lines accidentally on the screen. Um, hopefully it'll go away on the next slide. <laughs> um, so the, the increases for people who were, were implementing these assets on their own land uh, was anywhere from half of their previous yield to um, five times their previous yield with a median of sort of one and a half thing their yield. So going from 10 hectare, 10 uh, kilograms on average to 25. Um, people reported increased food security, the ability to manage a bad year, which they did not feel able to do before then, and decreased migration to cities in um, the south of the country. So 
this is really important because um, after these interventions, the communities that um, were were targeted, we only had to respond to 20% of previous numbers in terms of humanitarian need, meaning that this has a tangible improvement on the humanitarian outcomes during bad years like droughts. Um, for all surveyed households, food stocks last longer into the year, reducing reliance on what we call um, uh, lean season foods, which are usually twigs and and leaves, um, and even beyond the targeted uh, participants, people around the program area have started adopting these nature-based solutions, meaning that there's a clear case for their utility. Um, so just a couple of, of takeaways that we've learned from this implementation. Um, all nature-based solutions, especially these, require sustained investments over time. The NASA study found that, yes, there have been substantial increases in vegetation, but that that took some time. So you can't just go in, install something, and hope that it's going to make a difference the next year. It, it takes time, and it takes sustained investment over that time. Um, second, watersheds and ecosystems like these, they rarely obey administrative administrative boundaries. People move between states and communities, and especially for people with mobile livelihoods like pastoralists, you have to be thinking about the whole uh, constellation of administrations and uh, departments within the government and civil society uh, champions to make sure that these nature-based solutions are actually doing what we need them to do. And finally, every community is different uh, and unsustainable use of natural resources not evenly distributed between people who follow different livelihood strategies. So for example, in our study in, in this area where the implementation is happening, the agricultural assets are being invested in by people who we weren't even targeting to begin with. The pastoral assets, while they're providing a lot of benefit, there's a bit of a tragedy of the commons where it, this, the sustainability of these assets over time might be in question because people don't see the immediate financial benefits in sustaining them themselves. Everyone else is benefiting from them as well. So finding sustainable methods that are specific to local communities to make sure nature-based solutions are effective, doing what people need specifically, and that they are able to maintain them in perpetuity is really important. So um, that's all I had today. Happy to take more questions after the next speaker. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you, Julius, very much. Karina Pongo, please go ahead. You have five minutes. Well, thank you very much. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Thank you uh, to the IAI for the invitation, especially Marcela, Bran, Maria Inés, uh, for having a thought about me. So I'm going to focus my, my reflections and the definitions around the challenges regarding anticipatory diplomacy, which in the end, as many of the panelists have already said, try to address emerging issues at global level. Amongst these challenges, firstly, I would like to uh, explain a bit the international context. There is a uh, author like Richard Haas, called Richard Haas, if anyone would like to uh, expand a bit on this literature, which discusses the non-bipolarity that we are going through. And which emerges as uh, the interaction of different state stakeholders uh, to include non-state actors as well that also uh, interact in this multipolarized and globalized world where the communication between science policies and uh, diplomacy is great. Even though there are many state actors, international cooperation dilutes the power of national states and leads to multipolarization and new 
non-state uh, stakeholders which are emerging, which I would like to also add to um, add the local communities, which the different panelists have already referred to. In this international context is where a new type of diplomacy emerges. It's a diplomacy, not just based on science, but in all environments is a much more active and has a need to anticipate to events more than ever and is more linked to science, technology and innovation and is affected by the digital transformation and the new communication and information technologies, which have to address these global issues which affect us all around the world. And for this, there needs to be a concrete path forward with clear objectives and with a clear timeline to face these issues in science, technology and innovation. And these are key instruments. And in order to work in this uh, sphere, this diplomacy has to work with all government areas. And in here, we are facing a significant challenge uh, because of the different stakeholders that are involved in this type of diplomacy. We need to work with the environment, energy, climate, science, technology, health, agro-industry, uh, ocean research, production and knowledge economy. So in this in sphere is where diplo science diplomacy needs to emerge and should have uh, scientific advisors to then feed each other with problems and challenges that humanity is facing, especially we discuss climate change, but also to understand what the solutions are that science, technology and innovation can provide to these challenges. Thirdly, so we talked about the new international order, we discussed the new active uh, and anticipatory diplomacy that needs to emerge. And thirdly, as a challenge, the articulation between all stakeholders that were mentioned, policymakers, um, scientists, uh, entrepreneurs, academia, and in this webinar, there was a very important stakeholder that was mentioned regarding anticipatory diplomacy, which are local communities. And it's essential, therefore, when we talk about a concrete pathway that requires a timeline, deadline and specific objectives to discuss a strategy. We need to define a strategy and that in itself is a challenge which needs to be aligned with the objectives and very clear and specific objectives through a science policy and through a foreign policy, which is clearly defined and that steers our direction of where we're going and that underlying these objectives, not just discusses uh, foreign affairs, but also economic, social, geopolitical affairs as well. And on the other hand, within this strategy, we need to also have clear timelines. Uh, we need to measure things in the short, medium and long term regarding science, technology and innovation. And on the other hand, we're talking also about a science diplomacy that requires quick action in case where there are pressing issues such as climate change so that we can solve these issues which uh, the current solutions are not being able to solve because this is leading to loss of biodiversity. It's uh, leading to increased pollution and all the problems of climate change that you've mentioned. And this requires collaboration. So this scenario is quite complex that we need to um, address. And the other challenge is to implement an action plan. It has to be very specific. It has to be, have a clear idea of the topics that need to be addressed. Of course, this is always supported by the advice of scientists and experts and to harness the scarce financial resources or ill distributed resources that exist that are already in place. So these five challenges are the ones that make up a true science diplomacy, which is anticipatory. And secondly, and uh, related to the second question in this webinar, I would like to mention quite quickly how we could achieve an integration between experts, 
uh, diplomats, scientists that have to participate in an integration of science and policy to precisely uh, reach to this science diplomacy stance. First of all, it's essential to have training. And here, the Science Diplomacy Center of the IAI comes to play and all the different actions that are being undertaken at national level to train and raise awareness on science diplomacy, especially not just to scient scientific advisors, but also entrepreneurs and uh, diplomacy academia from all branches, not just training and raising awareness, but also to provide understanding on how science diplomacy works, how it's managed and how it's implemented. Secondly, we need to distinguish between science diplomacy and international science cooperation. And why do I strike a difference here? Because science diplomacy has a political connotation, which is much oriented towards strategy. Whereas international science cooperation in some cases is a bit more dispersed and is not able to align with the strategies of a true national, local or regional science um, approach. And therefore, I think it's also crucial that the implementation of action plans and the creation of cooperation agreements in the uh, area of science need to include not only governments, agreements can be intergovernmental or interinstitutional, but they should include, regardless of the type of agreement, all stakeholders from the uh, ecosystem of science diplomacy, diplomats that need to provide guidelines on foreign policy and the objectives of foreign policy and the uh, diplomacy institutions that are required to reach agreements. And on the other hand, they should also include uh, policy makers from the different levels of government, national, uh, provincial, local levels, so that we can complement uh, diplomatic cooperation with national or local objectives. On the other hand, they should also encompass, include all government institutions that are addressing these topics of climate change, energy, biodiversity, the environment, oceans, so on and so forth, that could coincide or not necessarily with financing institutions or bodies. And this is another topic that emerges. How can we finance and, and sustain all this implementation. Let's not forget that sometimes the donor or whoever finances makes the decisions and therefore they have to be included in the decision making process so that we can see where the funding is headed. I'm not going to leave out um, scientific uh, advisors who are expert mat um, subject matter experts and who can uh, guide actions and implementation and uh, who are fully aware of where the um, finance should be steered towards. And of course, when we talk about innovation and development um, and the development of patents and uh, technology, of course, the technological environment should be included. So if we manage uh, management, which includes all of these characteristics of uh, action plan financing and results, and it's all aligned between uh, all stakeholders, then we'll be able to reach a true anticipatory science diplomacy. Thank you very much. Actually, you already answered the second question that we had, but we can move now forward with the next question. I think that it could be a good idea for all of us to answer, to try to answer this question, because one of the topics that emerged or transpired in your participation was uh, how to think of our future how to create greater impact in the initiatives that are 
being carried out in a multipolar global environment where we need to keep collaboration and where we might have some fragmentations in terms of how these issues are tackled with a future perspective. We know that climate change is the main issue, but we've been talking about this for 30 years and we've talked with the parties and we have thought about common solutions and equitable solutions that involve the different social players, um, the regional, international players as well in how they can have an influence or approach climate change in a more holistic way that includes capacity building and that um, specifically, for example, Anna suggested a multicultural approach where we develop uh, technology or technological changes have an impact in the ecosystems, the changes in the use of the soil um, that has a different impact uh, depending on whether these are indigenous or native populations or not, there seems to be a difference on how we deal with the use of the soil in the different territories. Uh, so what we need to try to obtain is a democratic ideal for the use of the territories with social participation. So I think that that has to do with a cross-cutting transdisciplinary approach because there's no a single uh, uh, discipline that can um, approach these problems. So we need scientists, diplomats, the civil society, the local populations, etc. So I think that I can ask the question out loud. The question has been removed. How can experts, diplomats, or scientists collaborate more effectively to integrate science into international policy making to address emerging global problems resulting from climate change? Anna, would you like to start? Uh, yes. I would like to answer this question based on the comments made and one of So there is much uncertainty in scientific diplomacy for these emerging topics. There was a metaphor that says that in the dark, the science was going to be the light that would guide us. If we think about it that way, it uh, scientific Scientists have a great responsibility if we think that they should be the ones to lighten the darkness uh, within this uh, context of lack of financial solutions, fragmented uh, policy making, and issues that have not been solved, and we're trying to generate solutions to conflicts so we can see that this darkness is huge and is overwhelming. And that is a challenge for the expert, that is to understand what type of leadership, uh, for me at least, what type of leadership we should provide. We need to be able to keep the light to keep the flame uh, lit. And we are all responsible for that. So that if knowledge uh, is created and know-how, this should include everyone and should have the right tools so that uh, the parties have more power in this relationship. I think that this would be the first challenge. The second is that we should not be aligning policies, but orchestrating policies. I think that IAI has a big role to play in scientific diplomacy in Colombia, in Peru, in Canada, in the United States, 
uh, we are all somehow committed to making these efforts. So that's clearly apparently not the issue. The issue is how to orchestrate these efforts. How can we build on what others have built so as not to reinvent the wheel every time to use the lessons learned to understand that this is a heterogeneous process, but that also has a common background that come from our experience as a country and also from other international collaboration experiences for other environmental problems that we have faced. And finally, the last challenge for the academia is the financial sustainability. How can we create information for these types of processes that requires technology, innovation, social sciences, humanities, because uh, the local populations are main actors and main players in developing these solutions. So that, that means that we need not just science and technology, but also contributions from other uh, areas like social sciences. And in Latin America, it's becoming increasingly more difficult to obtain the funding because the traceability is important. We need to show that the solutions work. We need to provide legitimacy to the specific proposals that we make. So the result uh, of the analysis regarding this effort, this 10 year effort that needs investment. So how can the academia articulate with government and non-government players so as to reach this financial sustainability? What tools are we providing to the local players so that they can, one, incorporate different mechanisms for data gathering, uh, for information gathering, and how can they go to remote territories in many cases, and they need funding for this. This is not an easy, um, simple research or cheap research, it needs investment. And this is the other challenge. And the, uh, the last challenge would be not to lose our voices, to keep our voices uh, so that we can obtain this funding. I think that all of these uh, issues are important and they it can help our discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. We don't have much time. We can stay five more minutes, but no more than that. And I would like you to have shorter interventions, please. Uh, maybe uh, Julio and Lucia, you have the floor. Thank you, Maria Ness. In my first intervention, I told you the story that the situation of Colombia, that we have some progress in science and technology. And I told you that we have made progress also in the definition of a country agenda, country agenda in scientific diplomacy and how we need to articulate both uh, to move forward in this, pro this process. And I would like to tell you that right now I am in the academia and we see uh, this national proposal and we are considering how to articulate these efforts. We have an example with what we call the scientific diplomacy white paper for the Amaz for the Amazonia, for the Amazon forest. And we have created this white paper and we have created this country framework to define what we can do from, the dif from our different roles and to recognize the global challenge uh, to understand that the Amazon is facing a global challenge, that Colombia has this specific challenge and we need to capitalize uh, on this challenge to add and preserve biodiversity to tackle this problem urgently for the new generation. So this diplom scientific diplomacy white paper for the Amazon uh, deals with different elements 
that leads us to conclude that we need comprehensive approaches that combine the different uh, know-hows, but also the other types of knowledge uh, in this, specifically in this Amazon region. We need to articulate that with international cooperation, and that would be the way to approach the ecological and social challenges that we have in the Amazon. Uh, the white paper includes four recommendations. They include most of the challenge challenges that we mentioned today. They have to do with interdisciplinary approaches, uh, biodiversity to have uh, the right data so as to be able to make decisions. And we are proposing a joint monitoring agenda to be able to have an uh, advisory center at public level and also to be able to build capacities of the different know-hows of the different players and uh, any um, party that is an active part of the provision of knowledge. So uh, how can we strengthen this collaboration between the diplomats, the scientists, and the communities? I have a lot of ideas. I would like to leave you some of the ideas, and that would be that we need to strengthen an international policy culture based on evidence. We still need to consolidate uh, to build structures so that ne the negotiations are shared. We need to be able to integrate uh, scientists and diplomat teams to build policies. I told you that in Colombia, we have five policies, five missions, and one of them is the bioeconomy mission. Uh, we understand that the scientist networks in the diaspora can provide a network so that the governments can consult them and can build this dialogue so that we can uh, take the evidence and bring it to the di to international dialogue scenarios. And this would not be possible if we don't trust the institutions, if we don't trust the science and the diplomat network. So that involves mutual trust so that dialogue can be built and collaboration between our diplomats and scientists could be built. Thank you, Susan. Lucia, please very briefly. Yes, I would like to mention uh, what we mentioned about the safe space for our exchanges in my experience with the Gulf of Mexico shared by Cuba, United States and Mexico. There have been examples of scientific diplomacy. For example, the first negotiation between Cuba and the United States, uh, there was a scientific diplomacy cooperation process for the maritime and coastal area. So how these um, spaces for dialogue and cooperation that have happened between the different scientific communities uh, have led to cooperation also among the local communities. And um, sometimes the concept of scientific diplomacy is not there or the wording, but the communities created to strengthen uh, scientific diplomacy, good practices, uh, have been created and also how these global problems are localized by the local communities. Uh, these are also experiences that continue to contribute to the scientific diplomacy uh, actions. And um, this is something that we have placed a lot of importance on, or we have emphasized. And yes, and good practices. I would like to then finish my intervention with that. 
with the consideration of good practices that I think that they are important to systematize processes and that the assessment and monitoring processes could be systematized and that in those cases, uh, usually research is carried out, but there is not enough funding for assessment and monitoring. And uh, uh, we need um, in this long-term assessment and monitoring processes, we need more time, more funding so that we can obtain accurate data so as to be able to make decisions and that would lead to the appropriate monitoring and assessment, especially in urban areas and the urban um, research and loss of biodiversity funding. There are different funding uh, projects that were created by local governments and it would be important for local governments to have this funding with them so they don't have to depend so much on the national or international decisions or other agencies' decisions for their funding. So that would be it, to strengthen capacities, to become aware of the interaction and community networks that we already have and to be aware of the need for investment in order to be able to assess and monitor this knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Julius. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, this is an excellent question and it's actually directly related to what I worked on for my step fellow um, project with our group. Um, so thanks to the EIE for giving us the opportunity to read through some of the literature on that. Um, but so one of the biggest takeaways that we had was that what makes nature-based solutions successful is sustained advocacy from multiple nodes in the stakeholder map. Um, it's what Anna said. It's not about aligning interests necessarily. It's about orchestrating so that everyone who has an interest is in the room and discussing the important things. So a great example, another one from West Africa is farmer managed natural regeneration, which is a traditional practice of agroforestry that requires cutting down harmful trees to agroforestry systems and pruning uh, good ones so that they can provide the most benefit they can in agricultural settings and making sure that this is an option for farmers which is a historically traditional practice requ has required bringing in forestry um, departments actually because it's required reconsidering policies that limit the management of trees on agricultural land. Um, so this is a, an objectively good thing, but that is being held back by certain policies. And so making sure that it's not just the scientists and it's not just the agritechs who are in the room, but also people who you might not expect in that stakeholder map. Um, th that because nature-based solutions is so multi-sectoral and so multidisciplinary, it requires making sure that the things that typical practitioners usually think of um, are also included in that that stakeholder uh, orchestration as Anna uh, put it. Um, so that's it from me. I'm gonna have to jump off in a few minutes but would love to hear the last <laughs> the last uh, Q and a. Thank you very much. Well, we're getting to the end. Unfortunately, we won't have enough space for questions. All the presentations were excellent. We have learned a lot and many challenges have been set forward to keep improving. But as I said at the very beginning, this is the first of a series of webinars. We'll continue addressing different topics that include emerging issues, uh, quite sensitive topics, uh, such as the international global order. And so we um, encourage you to follow uh, the website of the IAI, which is in the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to write to us. And um, I believe that the questions done asked in the chat have been answered indirectly. So Marcela will have the floor for closing up this webinar. Thank you so much, Inez, and uh, a special thanks for all the panelists, uh, uh, Maria, Susan, Ursula, Karina. Uh, it was excellent to listen to everyone, uh, not just on science diplomacy and the emerging issues and nature-based solutions, but also trying to 
see the challenges that lie ahead that we're all facing. It's a global problem. No country institution on its own is able to address these issues. And as we saw, all these topics are becoming more complex, um, bigger. And so the different disciplines are required as well as integration with other types of knowledge, such as um, local communities and indigenous peoples. These are key. These are solutions provided by communities that have addressed different topics, environmental issues in different ways, and also to integrate this knowledge and to strengthen uh, capacity building from different social stakeholders, not just from scientists and uh, government officials, but also from institutions and members of civil society. And I believe that uh, spaces for dialogue are something that the Science Diplomacy Center uh, is trying to look for, to strengthen, to create these safe spaces where different social stakeholders can convene and can bring together different communities and countries. And as Julius said, to orchestrate this based on uh, all comments made on respond to the different interests and the different uh, challenges that each is facing, but that all of us at professional individual level and institutionally speaking, we all share. And so to try to find shared solutions combines uh, lessons learned uh, on science and referring to best practices and lessons learned. So for us, it's also very important, and Susan said, that these topics need to be cross-cutting, needs to be multi, um, address different perspectives. You've all discussed the need for sustaining this, for uh, financing and public policies that are able to maintain sustainability for this common good and not just for the sake of management. So I think it's many challenges that need to be faced. And I conclude with your comment, Karina, regarding the difference between technical scientific cooperation and science diplomacy. And for the IAI, I think the importance of science diplomacy is because we have been working for 19 governments. And so the agendas of each government and how to see science diplomacy at international level can bind countries together and the scientific community to addressing these uh, major challenges jointly, which do not know of borders. They're regional, transcontinental, and global. And with this, I would like to thank again everyone who is present in this webinar, to all the participants for the questions that you've written in the chat, which I hope were answered. And thank you again to the panelists for being able to answer these questions and presenting these important topics. And I hope that we are able to see you in the upcoming seminar. And thank you again for the IAI team, Ines, Claudia, and all the STEP fellows, which have undertaken much work to organize this first webinar at the Science Diplomacy Center. Thank you very much, everyone. Well, thank you very much, Marcela. We would like to take a final picture before you leave. So if you, would, if you wouldn't mind turning on your cameras, all the participants, the panelists, I think everyone is ready for the picture. Jonathan, can you give us a heads up? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's see if anyone else turns on their camera so that they can be included in the picture. Well, so all of you are welcome to turn on your cameras. So smile. Done. Well, thank you again, everyone for participating. A round of applause for everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Bye.